What's going on guys? I'm Shane and today we're going to be taking a look at the NAD M17 V2. If you're familiar with the M17 that originally came out in 2014, this is the same thing but with immersive audio. So Dolby Atmos is now on board, hence the V2. The chassis is going to be the same as the standard M17 along with its front panel touchscreen. If it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? All right, let's unbox it. So the V2 retails for $6,000. It's a premium device at a premium price. It's not your typical mass-produced product. Inside we get some manuals, magnetic feet that attach to the spike feet so that you don't scratch your shelves. Here's a USB thumb drive, a mini basic remote control with a spare battery, the main remote control which is quite nice. On the bottom of the box is another box containing the Blue OS adapters and the calibration mic. Here's the power cord and mini XLR adapters. The M17 has got some good weight coming in at 24 pounds. Not quite as heavy as the 8805 that I just reviewed, but I do think this looks a lot cooler. So taking a look around front, we have a very clean minimalist design. Dead center is the LED touchscreen which you can use to handle all navigation with the volume knob on the right. On the left side is the NAD logo which will light up when it's powered on. On the top left edge is where you'll find the touch sensitive power button. Following the unit's striking design are mesh ventilation grills that are inlaid in the aluminum. It follows the black against silver contrast found on the front. I happen to like the look and it's a shame that it's going to be hidden in the equipment rack. Let me just come back to the remote once more. This is how you make a remote control. It feels like it's about two pounds of solid aluminum. You can crack someone's head open with this thing. Oh, and it does have backlighting. So nice touch NAD. Around back are balanced XLR preouts for the lower seven channels plus one subwoofer. The M17 does have dual sub outs, but the second subwoofer output is an RCA. I'm not sure why that is, but it is what it is. There's also unbalanced RCA outputs for the lower 7 if you're not equipped with an amplifier that has XLRs. Now something I haven't seen in a pre-pro before are mini XLR outputs for the height channels. Luckily, NAD does provide the mini to full size adapters. I didn't find too much of an issue with this, but it does make for a somewhat clunky installation with all these dangling adapters. You also get a pair of coax and optical inputs along with 7 additional RCA inputs and outputs which you can assign to an additional 3 zones. There are 5 HDMI HDCP 2.2 compliant inputs with 2 HDMI outs. Now if you're connecting both HDMI outs, they'll both output the same thing. So you can't have 2 separate video outputs through HDMI. That took me a minute to figure out till I actually read the manual. We also have a LAN and a USB input with a host of triggers and an RS-232 connection for custom installs. Now one of the main features of this processor is what NAD calls Modular Design Construction, or MDC for short. This basically lets you unscrew, let's say, the HDMI section here, pop it out, and if HDMI 2.2 or 4.0 becomes necessity, you'll be able to just upgrade the HDMI section. The M17 did originally come out in 2014, but since Atmos was taking off, they were able to offer an upgrade module to add the height channel outputs in the form of these mini XLRs. Of course, the upgrades will come at an additional cost, but that is some awesome support five years later on a single chassis. All right, now for a little context. Before I get this thing hooked up, I'll be connecting the M17 to a pair of Outlaw amps, the 7 channel 7220, which will power my lower seven channels, and their Model 5000, which will power the four height channels. An SVS PV16 will be handling all bass duties, and I've got a full Arendel Sound Atmos speaker setup. I know you guys probably haven't heard of the Norwegian speaker brand, but if you want, you can head on over to my own personal channel and check out that review. Okay, let's get it hooked up. This is the main menu. I won't get into too much detail on this because it's all pretty self-explanatory, but keep in mind that you can't overlay any of this on top of any video. So if you need to make any changes, you're gonna be interrupting your video watching. First up are DSP options. Tone controls, which I kept off, but you can adjust bass and treble to your liking. Here are your zone setup options, which are audio only outputs. So no video. Here's the HDMI control settings. source settings, which you can rename and assign specific inputs to. Everyone knows this, the speaker configuration, 
you can adjust your size and your crossovers here. Here's your speaker levels that you can measure manually in half increments. If you're running direct, then you'll set it through the program. Same thing for speaker distance. These are one foot increments, but I'm gonna assume anyone buying this will have direct do it for them though. The rest of these options are pretty easy to figure out. So if you need to see something, just hit the pause button. Now onto direct setup. You can use the included microphone or the app, which is iOS and Android compatible. Or if you have your own mic like the Mini DSP U Mic 1, then just go ahead and plug that into the laptop. Once you download the software, just open it up and it should find the M17. Of course, you're gonna have to have the M17 wired up to your network. Now I'm just gonna run through this quickly so this is in no way a detailed walkthrough. Now depending on which microphone you have plugged in, just select it and you'll have to pick a calibration file, which I already did. Just be sure to have your microphone set up at the main listening position before moving on. Once you do that, go ahead and hit the play button, which will send a test tone through your speakers. You wanna be sure it's in the green and not in the red. You'll have to do this for every speaker. When that's all done, you'll have to pick your seating arrangement, either chair or sofa. I chose sofa and wide positioning to give a wider measurement. Now onto the measurement. I actually have two rows of seating, so I wasn't sure how to run this. So I did contact the guys at Dirac, and they just said to spread the microphone positions out and measure it that way. So I just took this diagram and just spread it outwards. You will have to measure 17 positions, so it's gonna take about 45 minutes or so. Just pray you have a solid connection and that the program doesn't quit midway through because you'll have to start all over again. Trust me, I know. Once you pick your first position, which should be the sweet spot, just click measure and a test tone will run through every one of your speakers. You'll be doing this 17 times, so be sure to grab a snack. After about an hour, you'll end up with a graph like this. The speakers are paired into separate groups on the right side. You can see the measured response and the target curve. You can select all the speakers as a group and adjust the curve together at once, or you can do them individually. The M17 comes with a full version of Dirac, so you get correction from 20Hz to 20K. If you keep your eye at the bottom of the screen, once you're done tweaking your curves, it'll say designing magnitude response. Once it's done with all the calculations, you can proceed to filter export. Give it a name and it'll get sent over to the M17. You can now go back into the settings menu and select it. Or to activate Dirac faster, you can just tap on it on the touchscreen. This makes for A and B comparisons a lot easier. Okay, so how does this thing sound? Well, for six grand, it better sound stupendous. And I gotta say, yeah, it's pretty badass. Easily the best sounding pre-pro I've listened to so far in my theater. And just to keep things consistent, I went ahead and used a couple of my go-to demo scenes that I used when I reviewed the Marantz 8805 and the Anthem AVM60. First being A Quiet Place. I'm not gonna reference the Marantz because I thought the Anthem was a little better sounding. At least in my room it sounded better. It might be different in yours. Anyways, I thought Anthem's room correction did some amazing work to open things up. This being my first time listening to Dirac was kind of the same feeling I got when I heard Ark for the first time. Ark is Anthem's room correction. Wow, I probably say this a lot, but if you've got a proper surround sound system with 11 speakers, you don't wanna be hearing 11 speakers. You want that I'm there in the scene sensation. So a quiet place, it's a quiet movie. So you want amps and a processor with a low noise floor. 
You don't want to hear any buzzing, hissing, or humming, or anything like that. And the NAD was silent in my setup. So being able to hear the slightest nuance in these Atmos mixes with the perfect audible steering to specific parts of my room was fantastic. The wind moving through my listening area and the crunching of leaves and pattering of bare feet never sounded so good. Depth seemed to reach well beyond my speakers. So having that real outdoor feeling in chapter one of this movie was awesome. I of course checked out Power Rangers, which I think is at most perfect. But more recently, I had watched Aquaman. If you hadn't seen it, this is straight up audio demo worthiness. The NAD gave me some excellent seat to seat bass smoothness. Bass wasn't perfect for every seating position, but it was definitely less bumpy with no major suck outs. When I had the Integra in here, I would get some huge peaks in my back seats, while the M17 was noticeably smoother in the bass department. Now, I bring up Aquaman because bass is just out of control in this movie, and there were some pretty aggressive overhead Atmos effects too. So sound movement, like the bass quality, transitioned from speaker to speaker effortlessly. So there was no sound as over here in the left speaker, then all of a sudden it's in the top right, and then to the back speakers. It's just seamless tanning. So what I got was real cohesiveness to the audio. Again, this is all with Dirac Room Correction active. I have heard that Dirac can kind of make sound a little thin, but I did use their default curve and I thought it sounded excellent, at least in my space. If you're a real technical audioholic like Gene, then you can easily go in and change the curve to your liking. I'm sure Gene will get his hands on Dirac at some point in time and do a real technical breakdown, so you guys are gonna have to stay tuned for that. Now, let's talk about the other new addition to the version two of the M17. It's the inclusion of Blue OS. This is from their sister brand, Blue Sound. It's a high-res multi-audio system with MQA support. So just like Sonos, you can tie this all together with the Blue Sound speakers and audio streamers. I didn't have any other devices that supported Blue OS, so I couldn't test any multi-room functionality. But for some straight two-channel listening, this thing images amazingly well. I got a huge upfront soundstage with clear instrumental localization and a very focused center image. I think most people will be buying this for its surround sound duties, but it sounded excellent with any music that I threw at it. Only thing that bugged me about using this feature was the way they designed the adapter. This is just a clunky mess here. I mean, it's hidden away, so you don't really see it. Also, I should mention that I did speak with one of the NAD engineers and asked about the dual subwoofer outputs. Apparently, they're not running an internal Y connector, they're actually parallel outs. But Dirac in this current state corrects both outputs as one, so there is no individual correction being applied to each subwoofer. News is that Dirac has a version that will support multiple subwoofers coming very soon. I asked if the M17 would get that upgrade, and I was told that it's totally possible, but as of right now, there's no concrete yes or no. I don't see why they wouldn't offer it, but you know, who knows. Now there are two issues that I had with this. First being the obvious. There is no support for DTS-X as of right now. I mean, there's not a ton of movies out there in the format, but should the occasion arrive and that new Jurassic Park movie drops, you're stuck with DTS HD. I mean, there are $200 Ankyos with DTS X support. This is six grand. They need to hop on this. Good news is though, supposedly this summer it's coming, but don't hold me to that. Number two is HDMI. It's a bit wonky. I spoke with them about my troubles. And let's say if your source switches resolution or color space, refresh rate or some other combo, It'll just throw off communication and you'll get a black screen. I got this all the time when I had the Apple TV set to match content. I'd watch a movie, then back out, then black screen. I'd have to switch to another input, then go back, just to make the picture reappear. I've also noticed while watching or trying to watch 3D movies from my home theater PC, that once the 3D resolution switches over, the image will cut out all over again. I'd have to disconnect the HDMI from my PC, then hook it up straight to another monitor, and then manually switch back to the original resolution. So trying to watch 3D Blu-ray rips from my PC just wasn't happening. Now I do have this hooked up to a Sony 695 ES projector, so maybe it could just be an issue with the HDMI handshake for that display. There's a chance that none of this would happen with a regular TV, or maybe I just had a sensitive review sample. So if any of you guys out there own the M17, then leave us a comment down below and let us know if you've experienced anything like I've mentioned. So final thoughts. This has got a hefty price tag, no doubt about it. But for me personally, I felt the moment that I pulled it out of the box, I knew this was a premium product. This is not like other pre-pros from other brands that use inexpensive steel chassis. This is legit build quality right here. Having Dirac Live on board changed the audio sphere in my room. It's the best room correction I've tried hands down. And one of the most important factors I think when considering the cost of this unit is future proofing. If you were an original M17 buyer from years ago, all you had to do was drop a few hundred bucks and bam, you've got a full Atmos system without having to buy a whole new processor. I wish every company would adopt this way of upgradability. It'd probably make buying a lot less stressful. So this is a simple, no frills type of pre-pro. 
There isn't a ton of DSP options to make your room sound like a cathedral or loaded with 500 internet radio stations. It's straight and to the point. It sounds like a million bucks and it only costs 6,000. That's a bargain. Well, maybe. So guys, be sure to let us know if you've got this in your audio setup. And if not, is this something that you guys would be considering? Swing by our Patreon page, be sure to like, share, and subscribe. And remember, keep listening.